Professor Toby Walsh is an expert in artificial intelligence and one of Australia's rock stars of the digital revolution. He's been on sabbatical in Berlin, where he is guest professor at TU Berlin, but he's kindly joined us to be the final speaker here at Unsomnia. Please welcome, talking about computers making life or death decisions, Toby Walsh. Good. I, I haven't brought this um, smartphone up because I'm so depressed after all those talks. Uh, you'll see why I brought it up in a second. So when I was a young boy, I read far too much science fiction. Authors like Arthur C. Clarke, Isaac Asimov. And their books were full of robots and intelligent machines. And there's a good reason that science fiction is full of robots and intelligent machines. Because that's part of our future. And that future seems to be arriving very quickly. And that's where the smartphone comes in. I've got a, an app on this smartphone. It was an app that was developed, it's Poly AI, AI Poly. It's developed here in Australia. It's got a, an AI, a machine learning program on it. It's designed for, oh, we've got it up there. Yeah, it's designed for people with limited vision. Uh, you turn the app on and you get the object out or you point it at whatever you want to see, press the button. Press the button. Mail. Uh -huh. Ball. Ball. Mouse. Underwear. I brought a bra. <laughs> bra. <laughs> Be careful where you point it. Tablet. Envelope. But, uh, iPad. You can Sun point it. It's uh, yeah, still technology in, in development, but uh, <laughs> you should never demo things to a public, right? You know, they always get a key chain. There you go. So, uh, but that's an example. What's really amazing about this app not is that. <laughs> is that it's running on the device. We've made the, the algorithm smart enough and small enough that you don't need an internet connection. It's actually running on the iPhone and helping to transform people's lives. So science fiction is becoming science fact. And lots of people are wondering, well, where's this all going to end? Uh, the famous physicist Stephen Hawking made his prediction. He said that it could be the end of humanity. And that was backed up by Elon Musk, um, the founder of Tesla, someone who knows something about disruption. Uh, he said, it's our greatest existential threat. So not surprisingly, when I talk to the media, which I seem to do a lot these days, about where is this all going to end, they put up a picture of Terminator. So I have a picture of Terminator tonight again. It's not Terminator that keeps me awake at night. And I'm just going to try and help dispel a few misconceptions that lots of people have about where artificial intelligence, AI, is going to take us. So the first misconception is that it's, it's autonomy, not AI, that we have to worry about. The fact that we're giving machines the ability to act in the world and they're making life or death decisions. And we're seeing that already today with autonomous cars. The problem with autonomous cars today is that they're not very smart yet. So it's not smart AI that's the problem, it's stupid AI. It's incompetence, not malevolence, that we have to worry about. And we do want to build autonomous cars. A thousand people in Australia will die in road traffic accidents in the next year. You think about that for a second. That's the audience of this room, twice over, will die in road traffic accidents next year. And 95% of those road traffic accidents are caused by driver error. So the sooner we can get the driver out of the loop and replace them by a much more reliable computer, the safer our roads are going to be. And there's going to be immense other benefits, economic and social. It's going to give mobility to the elderly, to the young, to the disabled. It's going to tra totally transform the economics of transportation. There was a study done for the city of Lisbon, and it was estimated that you could provide the same transport needs with one-tenth of the cars. This is going to free up our cities. Another misconception is that the machines will have sentience, desires, even consciousness. Earlier this year, in March, there was a landmark match 
um, between Lisa Dahl, who was one of the world's best players at, at Go, and uh, Google's AlphaGo program. Now, Go is the Mount Everest of board games. It is far more challenging than chess. I've, I play Go very badly. When, in 1997, Garry Kasparov, who was at the time the world grandmaster at chess, was beaten by IBM's Deep Blue program, the New York Times tried to console humanity by making the observation that it would be at least 100 years before we could win, or before a machine could win, uh, against a human at Go. And Go masters had said, in fact, it would never happen. But it was such an intuitive game that, that machines would never have the human-like characteristics to be able to play this game, which was not a great consolation for Lisa Dahl when he lost 4-1 to the machine. But AlphaGo is not going to wake up tomorrow and say, look, you know, you, you guys, you humanity, you're no good at Go. I think I'm going to earn some money at online poker. Or, as some people would have you think, no, you know what? I'm going to take over the planet. It's not in its code. It's never going to do anything other than play Go. In fact, even to get it to play chess would take man years of effort. Also, hidden up in that match, although it was a defeat, there was actually a great victory for humanity. Now, to learn to play Go that well, AlphaGo played itself billions and billions of times. If you started playing Go the moment you were born, and you only ever played Go the whole of your life, you would never may play that number of games of Go. In fact, if the whole audience here today only played Go the whole of their lives, you would never have played as many games of Go as AlphaGo. AlphaGo is a very slow learner. But AlphaGo learned to play actually a new type of Go. Go masters are quite excited. It made moves, especially in the beginning of the game, that Go masters had never seen. And just like with computer chess, it's, it's going to, they think it's going to open up the game of Go. Now, Lee Sedol lost the first three games, but he learned in those three games enough about this new way of playing Go that he won the fourth match. We humans, we're very quick learners. We have to be. It's baked into our DNA by millennia of evolution. If you're being chased by a tiger, you don't have time to be a slow learner. <laughs> so if those aren't the things that are keeping me up at night, what are the things that are keeping me up at night? And I want to spend the rest of my talk telling you about the two things that do keep me awake at night. The first is a problem called algorithmic discrimination. The fact that we're letting machines make decisions and they may be discriminating against us. Let me tell you about a, a program called Compass that's been developed in the United States. It's a machine learning algorithm that predicts the probability that a violent criminal will reoffend. Now, you could use this to decide on where to spend limited probation services. You could help those people keep them out of jail, make society a slightly safer place. That's not how it's being used. No, it's being used by judges to decide when to release people on probation, to decide bail conditions, to decide the length of sentences. Now, you're probably feeling a bit morally dubious about this. And then there's a sucker punch. The program was shown to be discriminatory against blacks. It's more likely to predict that black people will reoffend than they will. And it's more likely to predict that white people will not reoffend when they will. Black people are ending up in jail because of a buggy program, and white people are being released incorrectly because of a buggy program. Now, even if we could get the program to be correctly predicting the probability that criminals would reoffend, there's still that deep philosophical question, should we? Depriving people of their liberty is one of the most serious decisions we make as a society. And it's one that I don't think we should be giving to the machines. And the second and final thing that keeps me awake at night is the problem of lethal autonomous weapons, or as the media like to call them, 
killer robots. Now, you're probably thinking of Terminator again. But the problem here is much simpler technologies. Technologies that are at best, or at worst, depending on your opinion, only a few years away. Now, all of you will have seen drones flying above Afghanistan and Iraq. These are not autonomous. There's a soldier back in a container in Nevada who's flying that drone. And that soldier is making the final life or death decision to let off the rather aptly named Hellfire missile and kill someone on the ground. But it's a very small technical leap to replace that human by a computer. In fact, the UK's Ministry of Defense have said that they think it's technically possible today, and they have a prototype to demonstrate it. This is going to revolutionize warfare. In fact, it's been called the third revolution in warfare. The first revolution being the invention by the Chinese of gunpowder, the second invention being the invention of nuclear bombs, and this third revolution that will completely transform the efficiency and speed with which we can kill the other side. Now, I don't have time this evening to tell you about all the misconceptions that people have about killer robots. It's not going to be robots fighting robots. There's not some separate part of the world, the battlefield, where the robots are going to be fighting. You know, a signpost, robots, battles over here, please. We don't know how to build ethical robots that will follow international humanitarian law, that will distinguish between combatants and civilians. We don't know how to build robots that can't be hacked and used against us. And these weapons will fall into the hands of terrorists, rogue nations. They'll have no qualms against using, us, using them against us. These will be weapons of terror. And there's an arms race, I'm sad to tell you, already underway to develop them. The US DOD, the Defense Department, has $18 billion in its budget today to build the next generation of, of weapons, most of them are autonomous. I was sufficiently concerned about this that I got a thousand of my colleagues working in AI and robotics to sign an open letter last year to the United Nations calling upon a ban for such weapons. Today, that open letter has 20,000 signatures, uh, and I'll be going back to the UN for a third time to talk to the diplomats in two weeks' time to call for them to start the formal process of making a ban. Now, actually, I'm going to go off script. Uh, I'm going to tell you about Australia here. Australia has led the way in many arms negotiations. It was a, played a vital role in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, in treaties around biological and chemical weapons. But I'm very sad to tell you that it's one of the most resistant the diplomats, are, are, the Australian diplomats, are some of the most resistant people in these discussions. And we don't have long. Pandora's box will be opened, and we won't be able to close it. So, our future is full of robots and intelligent machines. If we can choose a good path, they'll take the sweat. We will leave lives that are healthier, wealthier, and happier. But I hope we choose the path in which we don't give computers decisions that only humans should be allowed to make. I started with telling you about my childhood love for the author Arthur C. Clarke, and I'm going to end by turning around his probably most famous quotation. Sometimes we should say to the robots, sorry, I can't let you do that. Thank you, good night, and sweet dreams. Ladies and gentlemen, Toby Walsh, quite fascinating.